the Financial Survival Network, helping you to survive and thrive in the new economy. Get your free financial survival toolkit and find out where to buy gold and silver safely at great prices. Sign up at FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. This is the Financial Survival Network. 1490 WGCH. This is Kerry Lutz, and you're listening to the Financial Survival Network, which is brought to you by Miles Franklin. They've been in business selling gold since 1990, and I'm a customer because when you buy, they ship. To find out more, go to milesfranklin.com or call them at 800-822-8080 and get a free quote. We all want to go discover a gold mine. It's everybody's fantasy to find that buried treasure locked within the Earth's core. Adrian Fleming has done it, and he keeps doing it. And we've got him on the line here to talk about it. His current venture is Prosperity Goldfields. He's up in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. He's on the line now. Adrian, how are you? Jerry, good morning. It's lovely to have an opportunity to chat with you again. And you as well. So what's going on uh, up in the wilds? Yes, um, good things, actually. Uh, Kerry, I've just come back from Nunavut. Our project is in the very southern part of Nunavut, just over the border from uh, Manitoba. And we are about one third of the way through our um, summer exploration program. And your listeners will probably remember that um, earlier this year, we merged um, one of my other companies, Smash Minerals, which had has a project in uh, the Yukon, a gold exploration project. We merged Smash and Prosperity. And we've, we as the um, Vancouver-based team have taken over managing the joint company. So Prosperity has two projects now, the Yukon project, but more importantly, um, what we call the Kayuk, K-I-Y-U-K, gold exploration project in the southern end of it, just over the border from Manitoba. So that's where I've just come back from. And that's the focus of our current field program. What's it looking like there? Well, I might just uh, reiterate a a little bit of history very quickly here. The Canadian Geological Survey did systematic sampling of the slime and mud from the bottom of lakes all all, all the way across the southern part of back in 1976, and that's a long time ago. And from those samples, there were a couple of lakes in the vicinity of where we're now working that had anomalous values in the lake sediments, anomalous values for arsenic. Now, at that stage, gold assaying wasn't as sensitive as it is these days, so the Canadian survey actually didn't even assay these samples for gold. But we know that in many parts of the world, there's a strong relationship correlation between gold and arsenic. And so in many places, if you've got anomalous arsenic in the rocks or the sand and sediment of the creeks or in the lake samples, that's a good spot to go and hunt for gold. So in 1992, some prospectors working for Comaplex went down there and were wandering around and found uh, interesting boulders and outcrops uh, with very nice gold grades up to an ounce per tonne right on the surface. Yeah, 92, still a long time ago. And then we are actually the third organization or company to work on this project. Newmont, uh, you know, one of the big big mining companies, big gorilla if you like, they did some work there at Kayuk in the mid-2000s, did a little bit of drilling and didn't really come up with anything. And then my colleague, Quinton Henning, I'm sure some of your listeners will know of Quinton because he's a very renowned geologist with, uh, I guess, the biggest scalp on his belt recently is uh, Gold Canyon with a very spectacular multi-million ounce uh, discovery in the Red Lake District of Ontario. Anyway, Quinton conducted a drill program at Coyote last year and made three separate discoveries, and we call those Cobalt, uh, Gold Point, and Rusty. Yeah, Rusty, I saw. Yeah, Rusty. So... The third drill program was the one we did this year in the spring, and it's really in the winter, but we call it spring because it sounds warmer. <laughs> <laughs> Makes everybody who's working there feel a lot better, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so that was March, April, and May, and our spring program uh, was about a dozen holes. We drilled three targets, that, or the three discoveries Quinton had made, but we also... Uh, made a discovery at a new target called Amundsen. Our best uh, drill hole from the spring program this year was at Rusty, uh, and that was uh, 61 metres of 3.3 gram per tonne, which is a very respectable um, intersect 
Dutch and in anybody's language, and it's as good, and I think, just a touch better than any of the holes Quinton drilled last year. So I'm, I'm ahead by a, a nose in front of him at the moment. But I've only made one new discovery, and he made three, so I really <laughs> am not up, to, up there with him yet. So at this Kayok area, we've got potentially all grade, if you like, intersections at three separate targets, Gold Point, Cobalt and Rusty, and then we uh, got one of our last drill hole from the spring program into a new target called the Munzen. Unfortunately, we lost the drill hole, and that intercept uh, was 40 metres of about a gram. Obviously not quite there yet because you kind of would want to have two to three gram per tonne open pitable material in this part of Canada. We're reasonably remote, but suffice to say, we've now got attractive indications in drill core at four separate locations. Now, there's five other targets, Kerry, in this area. We've got a big property position there. It's over 500 square kilometres. And so rather than rush back with the drilling program in the summer, and it's more expensive to drill in the summer because we're using helicopters to move everything around, whereas in winter you can just hop on your skidoo and drive everywhere because it's frozen. Right. So we have decided not to drill with the current summer program. But much more importantly, we've stood back and we're doing an exploration program that covers the entire property. Because all the previous work, going back to the lake sediment sampling that Geological Survey of Canada did in the 70s, the complex work in 92, the previous work has been based on people out prospecting, and we're still just within the tree line here. They're wandering around and saying, oh, look, there's a, there's a rusty-looking boulder there. Let's take a sample of that. And it comes back from the lab at 10 grams per tonne, and everybody gets excited. There's not much outcrop with this project. It's largely covered by debris left behind by the ice sheet. It covered all of Canada um, 15,000 years ago. So that's a bit of a constraint to our work. Um, and so this summer program we're undertaking now, we're doing uh, sampling across the whole property. We're doing a, a, a till geochemical sample every square kilometre. That's about 500 samples. We're going out and we're looking at all these um, indications on the surface, most of which are boulders that have been moved by the ice sheet. It's not our crop. And so we're putting together, I guess you could say, Kerry, a foundation on which to come back next year in the spring with a very vigorous drill program. So I wanted to put together a much more comprehensive geological, geochemical, uh, structural and geophysical picture than we had to date because... You know, it's not necessarily the case that the four targets that we've got drill holes into already are the best zones. And even though nine, a total of nine prospects have been found with people wandering around through the trees, there may actually be some that they haven't even picked up yet that this property-wide systematic geochemical sampling program will, will produce for us. So... I'm being a little cautious in my approach. I'm trying to be um, careful with the way I spend shareholders' money. It's that, you know, the market's pretty rough at the moment. It's, we've probably got about $2.8 million in the bank. I have very good control on my spending. I'm going to finish up the year with about a million in the bank going into the new year. But more, more importantly, on the back of this careful, diligent, systematic, property-wide activity that we're conducting, I think I'm going to be able to drill smarter next year. So I've got two drills on site. Uh, we're going to kick that program off probably late February. So we're calling it spring, even though we're still in the winter up there. It's much more cost-effective to work in the winter, as I said, than in the summer. So clearly, the very good drilling we've got at Rusty, which is our best-looking target, we'll probably have one drill turning on that target for two or three months with, you know, 10, 20, 30 holes because I want to start blocking out the deposit there. That mineralization is right from the surface. The discovery hole last year at Rusty was 50 meters of three grams right from the surface. And I was actually, day before yesterday, standing on the surface expression of Rusty. It's a little knob and you can sort of bust off pieces and, you know, geologists, we all go gar gar and we lick the rock and we sort of <laughs> show one and it was like, it's terrific. It's exciting and I wonder how big this thing might be and we get all Get, get all a, excited and get silly a about dreamy-eyed, kind of teary-eyed about right. it. Yes, almost. <laughs> <laughs> 
so the two drill program starting February March of 13 next year will focus probably one drill for the whole three month drill program on Rusty I want to I want to quickly be able to show people that we've got you know, the possibility of more than a million ounces right at that one target right from the surface well, that's a fine and then based on the results from this ongoing work that I won't have all the results back for until probably the end of September. We will then drill. We'll be able to rank all these other targets, including the ones, the other ones that have good drill intercepts in so far, and then very carefully and judiciously decide which of those other targets we ought to do um, wildcat drilling on. So it's uh, next year is going to be a combination of starting to block out uh, resources and making some more discoveries or building on some of the other great intersections that Quinton pulled with the 2011 drilling. Yeah. I'm pretty happy with the way, you know, I'm pretty happy with the way um, that the Kayok project is shaping up. You know, the market's been pretty nasty with us along with most of the rest of the junior um, sector. Oh, yeah, it's been uh, and merciless. Even, the, even the, the gold producers, you know, you sort of look at the Newmonts and Agnico Eagles and, and Kinrosses and and our Cisco's and you say, you know, these guys have got millions of ounces of resources. They're producing gold at five or $600 an ounce. They've been savaged. And, you know, uncertainty and turmoil going on in Europe, you'd think gold would actually be even higher than it is now. But, you know, you understand all this stuff a lot. You know, I'm just a geo. <laughs> <laughs> you understand well, all this stuff better than I do, so I, I should shut up and let you comment for your for well, the wonderful I would, people you have listening to the program. It's, it's fascinating to hear it because digging for gold, that's every kid's fantasy. But the market always acts to frustrate the majority of investors. And this time is no different than any other. So the way I look at it is it's shaking out all the weak holders. There's so many mining companies out there that are right now, they're worth more dead than alive. It's, exactly. it's remarkable. And you're starting to see the acquisitions take place. You know, a company I had owned shares in a few years back, and I was real happy it doubled or tripled was outfit called La Mancha. I think they're in Africa. Some Egyptian billionaire just wrote a check for 500 million and bought the company because the metal in the ground was $50 an ounce. His feeling is I'd rather have it in the ground and have my money there than in a bank. So this is what's going to happen. You're starting to see the acquisitions pick up and the thirst for gold, especially on the part of China shows no signs of diminishing. So whatever short-term gyrations are happening now, I've, I kind of impervious to them because yeah. obviously I don't own a mining company. If I did, I think yes. I'd be a little obsessed and uh, quite upset like people were at hard assets in New York, but you can't get tied up in the short term, my feeling, when like you said, they're producing five, six hundred dollars an ounce. The price is yes. over sixteen hundred. They're making a thousand dollars an ounce. You know what I just don't like to see is companies that are viable juniors go out to the royalty trusts and sell their souls for capital, and uh-huh. then wind up having to give silver and gold away at ten percent of its market value in perpetuity. So it's good that you're you're well capitalized through the end of this year and probably into a good piece of next year. And I think things are going to turn around well before you need to go back and start thinking about it. But that's my opinion. I'm not an analyst. If anybody <laughs> listens to me, anybody uh, invest their dollars according to the way I tell them to, which I don't tell them to, but if, if they do, then, you know, Hey, it's at their own risk, but that's just my own personal opinion. These markets, you know, in the short term appear completely irrational and you don't know what's going to happen. But the important thing is you've got a real mind in the making there. I mean, I was looking at some of the uh, grades, you're up to uh, seven, six, seven uh, grams per ton in some of your yes. uh, samples, right? That's right, yes. So, yes. so that's significant. And the fact that there's a million ounces there. And you don't even know what's on the property. It could literally be the tip of the iceberg or the tip of the glacier, as it were. That's really interesting. And it's in Canada. um, (laughs) Jerry, my target for Kayok um, is to find, is to define about, is to try and define three million ounces. And I think, you know, people will be noting that a lot of the newer discoveries um, in Canada and in Australia, open pit uh, new mine developments are sort of, starting to pull 1, 1. 1.5, 1. 1.7, 1. 1.3 gram per ton gold out of the ground. 
you know, we're we're uh, we're you know starting to get into a little bit of a more remote part of Canada. Thompson, Manitoba is the nearest town. Um, our access is by aircraft, but there's also winter road uh, access to the property. Um, given where we're, given where we're located, I think we're going to want to have three million ounces at around three gram per ton. That would be the basis for a very substantial and profitable mining operation. Now, it's going to take quite a lot of time and money to get to that point. You know, if, if our discovery track record, and I take people back to Underworld, where we had some nice success back in the Yukon in 2008, 2009, um, our discovery cost at uh, the Golden Saddle Deposit with Underworld Resources in the Yukon was about uh, $12 per ounce when we got bought by Kinross in 2010. Now, let's say we could do it in um, Nunavut for, let's say, 10, because it makes the math easy. So, you know, that's that's, gonna, that's $30 million we're going to have to spend in the ground. And if it costs us $15 an ounce discovery cost, that's $45 million we have to spend. So, you know, that's quite a lot of drilling, and it's another two or three years of work. Um, but with the multiple indications we have and with the very good grades we're seeing right from the surface, my kind of vision is that not only will we have a deposit at Rusty, subject to more drilling, obviously, because there's only just a few holes in, there's only four holes in the Rusty target so far. Probably need 40 to define a resource. Um, so, you know, I want Rusty 1, Rusty 2, and Rusty 3. And <laughs> <laughs> so part of what I'm doing now is to build a database across the whole property um, that will allow us to prioritize where Rusty 2 and Rusty 3 might be if, if you if you get my drift. Sure, understand. It sounds really exciting, and it's unfortunate you have to be doing it against this depressed market backdrop. But yeah. you know what? In times like that, you just focus on the goal, and you just move ahead because yes. you can't control the markets, and they're in turmoil right now. They're acting irrationally. But over the long run, you have a real good idea what's going to happen. And you've been around long enough to know it. So have I. But some of the younger guys, I guess, kind of get wrapped up in the moment and get very discouraged. And no, the market it? will come back. There's no yeah. doubt about that. We just don't know when. Uh -huh. And an interesting, another point I might like to make, Kerry, if you would let me, is that this year is the 40th anniversary, um, my 40th anniversary in this crazy exploration business. And you know, it's drill holes like um, hole three at Rusty in the spring program, which delivered 61 meters of 3.3. That just, you know, I, I get excited again, and I just <laughs> got to go out and do it again because it's such a thrill when you pull a, a great big drill hole, and it's an even bigger thrill when, you know, somebody buys your company um, or you have an opportunity to find enough to start looking seriously at the engineering and the metallurgy and the mining and all that boring stuff. Because to me. To me, the, the thrill is, it's the hunt, you know, it's the, sure. it's the possibility that that next drill hole might bring home the bacon again. And I've been very lucky to have been involved in, uh, you know, several projects now where, where we had that, the excitement of, of great drill holes and then another hole is good and another hole is good and another hole is good and you start to build up the volume of the, of the, the mineralized system that eventually the mining engineers can dig up and make gold bricks out of but uh, you know so i'm addicted i'm i'm an addict to this process i can't stop <laughs> hey and i've been at and, it for nearly 40 years <laughs> and along those lines now short of uh, having founded apple computer and run it short of being steve jobs is there any other thing you could have ever envision yourself doing i don't know i think the only other thing i would have liked to have done perhaps is um is make movies like Avatar and then, you know, have enough money to hop in a submarine and go to the deepest part of the ocean floor or something like that. But uh, that, that's another kind of skill set. Uh, I don't say I have that. But, yeah. no, I mean, I've, I've been lucky. I've had a lot of fun in the business. I still have fun. You know, I've got great people that I work with. Um, I'm sort of in the latter part of my career now. So, so mentoring younger uh, men and women coming into the industry is really important. And I was just thrilled to be up at our project the last couple of days because we've got uh, um, men and women there out uh, doing geological work and sampling and helping in the camp and, uh, you know, very upbeat uh, ambience. And, you know, I take a lot of time and effort to provide them with the best tools. Um, 
make it very clear to them what our goals are and then just say, listen, you know, you can do this. Just get on yeah, with run it. With you it. might be getting bitten by the bugs and it might be a bit uncomfortable in the field, but, you know, you're going to get to go fishing after supper tonight and the lake trout are 36, up to 36 inches long. So, you know, what better life can you have? And you mentioned women in the business now. I think that is so important and, and young people because at Hard Assets, I saw a lot of gray hair and a lot of shiny scalps. And I didn't exactly. see a lot of uh, long hair, scraggly kids there. And yeah. they have to get the word that this is a great career yeah. and yeah. that this is the future. Yeah, so I'm very into giving all my team, you know, very positive experience because, you know, we want, we want, to, we want to retain them in the, in the industry. We want to motivate them. We want them to tell their friends that, listen, you know, I just had a blast up there in, in, uh, in northern Canada this last summer and I just can't wait to get back again. Well, if I were a younger man, that's what I would be doing. And I keep telling my kids, go get geology degrees, get mining engineer degrees, petroleum engineer extractive industries that's where it's at but of course children being children kids being kids they know better than me so what am i going to do but uh, at least at least i put the bug in their ears and if at some point they decide that that's what they want to do they'll be able to do it so so i think you're doing a really great thing there keeping these kids in the loop getting more of them because uh, it's necessary it's like farming the average farmer is in his uh, mid fifties now in right. the States and in Japan, it's closer to 60. So we need to bring really? in the younger, the younger generation. That's a must. So Adrian, to find out more about prosperity gold fields, uh, your website again. Yes. It's uh, dub, 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 of course, prosperity goldfields.com prosperity goldfields.com or one word. And there's a lot of terrific information on the website. We keep updating it all the time. If you would love, want, if you'd like to talk to me, um, there's contact numbers on the website, and I'm more than happy to respond to phone calls or emails. Now, there's true transparency. The CEO of the company will take phone calls and emails from strangers. That's a great thing. Well, Adrian, Absolutely. after the quote-unquote summer drill season's done, we'll check in with you, see what new developments have happened, and we wish you the best of luck. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.